Section 16 of Poems of American History, Volume 2, The Revolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ed Humple. Chapter 9. New York and the Neutral Ground, Part 1. For more than a year following the Battle of Monmouth, Sir Henry Clinton remained cooped up in New York, while Washington, established in camp at White Plains, kept a sharp eye upon him. The thirty miles between their lines, embracing nearly all of Westchester County, was known as the neutral ground. New York was naturally crowded with royalist refugees, whom Clinton put to work on the fortifications. Sir Henry Clinton's Invitation to the Refugees, 1779 Come, gentlemen Tories, firm, loyal, and true, here are axes and shovels and something to do. For the sake of our king, come labor and sing. You left all you had for his honor and glory. He will remember the suffering Tory. We have, it is true, some small work to do, but here's for your pay, twelve coppers a day, and never regard what the rebels may say, but throw off your jerkins and labor away. To raise up the rampart and pile up the wall, to pull down old houses and dig the canal, to build and destroy, be this your employ, in the daytime to work at our fortifications, and steal in the night from the rebels your rations. The king wants your aid, not empty parade. Advance to your places, ye men of long faces, nor ponder too much on your former disgraces. This year, I presume, will quite alter your cases. Attend at the call of the fifer and drummer. The French and the rebels are coming next summer and the forts we must build, though the Tories are killed. Take courage, my jockeys, and work for your king, for if you are taken, no doubt you will swing. If York we can hold, I'll have you enrolled, and after you're dead your name shall be read, as who for their monarch both labored and bled, and ventured their necks for their beef and their bread. Tis an hour to serve the bravest of nations, and be left to be hanged, in their capitulations, to scour up your mortars and stand to your quarters, tis nonsense for Tories in battle to run. They never need fear, sword, halberd, or gun. Their hearts should not fail them, no balls will assail them. Forget your disgraces and shorten your faces, for tis true as the gospel, believe it or not, who are born to be hanged will never be shot. Philip Freneau on the last day of May, Clinton had succeeded in capturing the fortress at Stony Point, on the Hudson, had thrown a garrison of six hundred men into it, and added two lines of fortifications, rendering it almost impregnable. Washington, nevertheless, determined to recapture it, and entrusted the task to General Anthony Wayne, giving him twelve hundred men for the purpose. At midnight of July 15th, the Americans crossed the swamp which divided the fort from the mainland, reached the outworks before they were discovered, and carried the fort by storm. The Storming of Stony Point July 16th, 1779 Highlands of Hudson, ye saw them pass, night on the stars of their battle flag, threading the maze of the dark morass under the frown of the thunder crag. Flower and pride in the light-armored corps, Trim in their trappings of buff and blue, Silent they skirted the rugged shore, Grim in the purpose of work to do. Cross ye the ford to the moated rock, Let not a whisper your march betray, Out with the flint from the musket lock, Now let the bayonet find the way. Halt rang the sentinel's challenge clear, Swift came the shot of the waking foe, Bright flash the axe of the pioneer, smashing their bodies blow on blow. Little they tarried for British might, lightly they wrecked of the Tory jeers, laughing they swarmed to the craggy height, steel to the steel of the grenadiers. Storm King and Dunderberg, wake once more, sentinel giants of freedom's throne, massive and proud to the eastern shore, bellow the watchword, the fort's our own. Echo our cheers for the men of old. Shout for the hero who led his band, Braving the death that his heart foretold, Over the parapet, spear in hand. Arthur Giederman Wayne at Stony Point, July 16th, 1779 T'was the heart of the murky night, 
and the lowest ebb of the tide. Silence lay on the land, and sleep on the waters wide, save for the sentry's tramp, or the note of a lone night bird, or the sough of the haunted pines, as the south wind softly stirred. Gloom above and around, and the brooding spirit of rest, only a single star over Dunderbird's lofty crest. Through the drench of ooze and slime, at the marge of the river fen, File upon file slips by, see, are they ghosts or men? Fast do they forward press, on by a track unbarred. Now is the causeway won, now have they throttled the guard, now have they parted line, to storm with a rush on the height, some by a path to the left, some by a path to the right. Hark the peal of a gun, and the drummer's rude alarms. Ringing down from the height, there soundeth the cry to arms, thundering down from height, there cometh the cannon's blare. Flash upon flashing light, lightens the livid air. Look, do the stormers quail? Nay, for their feet are set. Now at the bastion's base, now at the parapet. Urging the vanguard on, prone doth the leader fall. Smitten sudden and sore by a foeman's musket ball. Waver the charging lines, swiftly they spring to his side. Madcap Anthony Wayne, the patriot army's pride. Forward, my braves, he cries, and the heroes hearten again. Bear me into the fort, I'll die at the head of my men. Die, but did he die that night, felled in his lusty prime? Answer many a field in the stormy aftertime. Still did his prowess shine, still did his courage soar, from the Hudson's rocky steep to the James's level shore. But never on fame's fair scroll did he blazon a deed more bright, than his charge on Stony Point in the heart of the murky night. Clinton Scollard The raids over the neutral ground continued, and among the boldest of the leaders on the American side was Colonel Aaron Burr. But not all of his knights were occupied in warlike expeditions. Fifteen miles away, across the Hudson, dwelt the charming widow Prevost, whom he afterwards married, and on at least two occasions Burr, with a boldness to touch the heart of any woman, succeeded in getting across to spend a few nights with her. Aaron Burr's wooing. From the Commandant's quarters on Westchester Height, the blue hills of Ramopo lie in full sight. On their slope gleam the gables that shield his heart's queen. But the redcoats are wary, the Hudson's between. Through the camp runs a jest, there's no moon, t'will be dark. Tis odds little Aaron will go on a spark. And the toast of the troopers is, Pickets lie low, and good luck to the colonel and widow Prevost. Eight miles to the river he gallops his steed, Lays him bound in the barge, bids his escort make speed. Loose their swords, sit athwart, through the fleet reach yon shore, Not a word, not a plash of the thick muffled oar. Once across, once again in the seat and away, Five leagues are soon over when love has the say. And old Put and his rider a bridal path know To the hermitage manor of Madame Prevost. Lightly done, but he halts in the grove's deepest glade, Ties his horse to a birch, trims his cue, slings his blade, Wipes the dust and the dew from his smooth, handsome face, With a kerchief she broidered and bordered in lace, Then slips through the box rose and taps at the hall, Sees the glint of a waxlight, a hand white and small, And the door is unbarred by herself all aglow, Half in smiles, half in tears, Theodosia Prevost. Alack for the soldier that's buried and gone, What's a volley above him, a wreath on his stone, Compared with sweet life, and a wife for one's view, Like this dame, ripe and warm in her India fichu. She chides her bold lover, yet holds him more dear, For the daring that brings him a night rider here. British gallants by day through her doors come and go, But a Yankee's the winner of Theo Prevost. Where's the widow or maid with a mouth to be kissed, When Baron comes a wooing that long would resist? Lights and wine on the buffet, the shutters all fast, And old put stamps in vain till an hour has flown past. But an hour for eight leagues must be covered ere day. Laughs Aaron, let Washington frown as he may. 
When he hears of me next, in a raid on the foe, he'll forgive this night's tryst with the widow Prevost. Edmund Clarence Stedman In June 1780, Clinton made a desperate attempt to capture the American stores at Morristown, New Jersey. At dawn of the 23rd, he advanced in great force upon Springfield, where General Greene was stationed. Overwhelming numbers compelled the Americans to fall back to a strong position, which the enemy dared not attack, and after setting fire to the village, Clinton retreated toward Elizabethtown. THE MODERN JONAS JUNE twenty third, 1780 You know there goes a tale, how Jonas went on board a whale, once, for a frolic, and how the whale set sail and got the colic, and after a great splutter spewed him up upon the coast, just like woodcock on a toast, with trail and butter. There also goes a joke, how Clinton went on board the Duke, Count Rochambeau, to fight. As he didn't fail to set sail, the first fair gale, for once we thought him right. But, after a great clutter, he turned back along the coast, and left the Frenchmen to make their boast, and Englishmen to mutter. Just so, not long before, old Nip and old Clip went to the Jersey shore, the rebel rogues to beat. But at the Yankee farms they took alarms, at little harms, and quickly did retreat. Then after two days' wonder, marched boldly up to Springton Town, and swore they'd knock the rebels down. But as their foes gave them some blows, they like the wind soon changed their mind, and in a crack returned back from not one-third their number. On June 6th, while on their way to Springfield, the British passed through a village called Connecticut Farms. They set it on fire, destroying almost every house, and one of them shot and killed the wife of Reverend James Caldwell, as she was kneeling at prayer in her bedroom. Her husband took the revenge, described in Mr. Hart's poem. Caldwell of Springfield June twenty third, 1780 Here's the spot. Look around you. Above on the height lay the Hessians encamped. By the church on the right stood the gaunt Jersey farmers. And here ran a wall. You may dig anywhere and you'll turn up a ball. Nothing more. Grasses spring, waters run, flowers blow. Pretty much as they did ninety-three years ago. Nothing more, did I say? Stay one moment. You've heard of Caldwell, the parson, who once preached the word down at Springfield. What? No. Come, that's bad. Why, he had all the jerseys aflame. And they gave him the name of the rebel high priest. He stuck in their gorge, for he loved the Lord God, and he hated King George. He had cause, you might say. When the Hessians that day marched up with Niphausen, they stopped on their way at the farms, where his wife, with a child in her arms, sat alone in the house. How it happened, none knew but God, and that one of the hireling crew, who fired the shot. Enough! There she lay, and Caldwell the chaplain, her husband, away. Did he preach? Did he pray? Think of him as you stand, by the old church today. Think of him and his band, of militant ploughboys. See the smoke and the heat of that reckless advance, of that straggling retreat. Keep the ghost of that wife, foully slain, in your view. And what could you, what should you, what would you do? Why, just what he did. They were left in the lurch for want of more wadding. He ran to the church, broke the door, stripped the pews, and dashed out in the road with his arms full of hymn-books, and threw down his load at their feet. Then above all the shouting and shots rang his voice, Put Watts into em, boys, give em Watts. And they did, that is all. Grasses spring, flowers blow, pretty much as they did ninety-three years ago. You may dig anywhere, and you'll turn up a ball but not always a hero like this, and that's all. Bret Hart 
Among the posts occupied by the British on the Hudson was a blockhouse just above Bergen Neck. Pastured on the Neck was a large number of cattle and horses, and on July 21st, 1780, General Wayne was sent, with some Pennsylvania and Maryland troops, to storm this blockhouse and drive the stock within the American lines. The attack on the blockhouse was repulsed by the British, the Americans losing heavily. It was this affair which was celebrated by Major John Andre in the verses called The Cow Chase. The Cow Chase, July 21st, 1780. Canto 1. To drive the kine one summer's morn, the tanner took his way. The calf shall rue that is unborn, the jumbling of that day. And Wayne descending steers shall know, and tauntingly deride, and call to mind in every low the tanning of his hide. Yet Bergen cows still ruminate, unconscious in the stall. What mighty means were used to get and loose them after all? For many heroes bold and brave, from Newbridge and Tapong, and those that drink Passaic's wave, and those who eat Supong, and sons of distant Delaware, and still remoter Shannon, and Major Lee with horses rare, and Proctor with his cannon. And all wondrous proud in arms they came, what hero could refuse, to tread the rugged path to fame, who had a pair of shoes. At six the host with sweating buff arrived at Freedom's Pole, when Wayne, who thought he'd time enough, thus speechified the whole. O ye whom glory doth unite, who freedom's cause espouse, whether the wing that's doomed to fight, or that to drive the cows, ere yet you tempt your further way, or into action come, hear soldiers what I have to say, and take a pint of rum. In temperate valor, then we'll string, each nervous arm the better, so all the land shall I, O oh, sing, and read the general's letter. Know that some paltry refugees, whom I've a mind to fright, are playing amongst the trees that grow on yonder height. Their fort and blockhouses will level, and deal a horrid slaughter, will drive the scoundrels to the devil, and ravish wife and daughter. I, under cover of the attack, whilst you are all at blows, from English neighborhood and Nyack, will drive away the cows. For well you know the latter is the serious operation and fighting with the refugees is only demonstration. His daring words from all the crowd such great applause did gain, that every man declared aloud for serious work with Wayne. Then from the cask of rum once more they took a heady gill, when one and all they loudly swore they'd fight upon the hill. But here, the muse hath not a strain befitting such great deeds. Huzzah, they cried, huzzah for Wayne! and shouting, did their deeds. Canto Two. Near his memorial pomp, the sun had journeyed from the horizon, when fierce the dusky tribe moved on, of heroes drunk as pison. The sounds confused of boasting oaths re-echoed through the wood, some vowed to sleep in dead man's clothes, and some to swim in blood. At Irving's nod, t'was fine to see the left prepare to fight. The while the drovers Wayne and Lee drew off upon the right. Which Irving t'was, fame don't relate, nor can the muse assist her. Whether t'was he that cocks a hat, or he that gives a clister. For greatly one was signalized that fought on Chestnut Hill, and Canada immortalized the vendor of the pill. Yet their attendance upon Proctor they both might have to boast of, for there was business for the doctor, and hats to be disposed of. Let none uncandidly infer that Sterling wanted spunk, the self-made peer had sure been there, and that the peer was drunk. But turn we to the Hudson's banks, where stood the modest train, with purpose firm, though slender ranks, nor cared a pin for Wayne. For them the unrelenting hand of rebel fury drove, and tore from every genial band of friendship and of love. And some within the dungeon's gloom, by mock tribunals laid, had waited long a cruel doom impending o'er each head. Here one behails a brother's fate, 
here one a sire demands, cut off, alas, before their date by ignominious hands. And silvered grandsires here appeared, in deep distress serene, of reverent manners that declared the better days they'd seen. O cursed rebellion, these are thine, thine all these tales of woe. Shall at thy dire insatiate shrine blood never cease to flow? And now the foe began to lead his forces to the attack. Balls whistling unto balls succeed, and make the blockhouse crack. No shot could pass, if you will take the general's word for true. But tis a de a bull mistake, for every shot went through. The firmer as the rebels pressed, the loyal heroes stand. Virtue had nerved each honest breast, and industry each hand. In valor's frenzy, Hamilton rode like a soldier big, and Secretary Harrison with pens stuck in his wig. But lest their chieftain Washington should mourn them in the mumps, the fate of Withrington to shun, they fought behind the stumps. But ah, Thaddeus Posset, why should thy poor soul elope, and why should Titus Hooper die, ay, die without a rope? Apostate Murphy, thou to whom fair Sheila ne'er was cruel, in death shalt hear her mourn thy doom. Ach, would ye die, my jewel! The Nathan Pumpkin, I lament, of melancholy fate, the gray goose stolen as he went, in his heart's blood was wet. The Nathan Pumpkin, I lament, of melancholy fate, the gray goose stolen as he went, in his heart's blood was wet. Now, as the fight was further fought, and balls began to thicken, the fray assumed, the general's thought, the color of a lickin. Yet undismayed, the chief's command, and to redeem the day, cry, soldiers charge, they hear, they stand, they turn, and run away. Canto three. Not all delights the bloody spear, or horrid din of battle. There are, I'm sure, who'd like to hear a word about the cattle. The chief whom we beheld of late, near Schrollenberg haranguing, at Yan Van Poop's unconscious sat, of Irving's hearty banging. Whilst valiant Lee with courage wild most bravely did oppose the tears of woman and of child who begged he'd leave the cows. But Wayne of sympathizing heart required a relief. Not all the blessings could impart of battle or of beef. For now a prey to female charms, his soul took more delight in a lovely hamadryad's arms than cow-driving or fighting. A nymph the refugees had drove far from her native tree, just happened to be on the move when up came Wayne and Lee. She, in mad Anthony's fierce eye, the hero saw portrayed, and all in tears she took him by, the bridle of his jade. Here, said the nymph, O oh, great commander, no human lamentations. The trees you see them cutting yonder are all my near relations. And I, forlorn, implore thine aid to free the sacred grove. So shall thy prowess be repaid with an immortal's love. Now some, to prove she was a goddess, said this enchanting fair, had late retired from the bodies in all the pomp of war. The drums and merry fifes had played to honor her retreat, and Cunningham himself conveyed the lady through the street. Great Wayne, by soft compassion swayed, to no inquiry stoops, but takes the fair afflicted maid right into Gan Van Poops. So Roman Anthony, they say, disgraced the imperial banner, for a gypsy lost a day, like Anthony the Tanner. The Hamadryad had but half received redress from Wayne, when drums and colors, cow and calf, came down the road amain. And in a cloud of dust was seen, the sheep, the horse, the goat, the gentle heifer, ass obscene, the yearling and the shoat. The pack-horses with fowls came by, befeathered on each side, like Pegasus, the horse that I and other poets ride. Sublime upon his stirrups rose, the mighty Lee behind, and drove the terror-smitten cows like chaff before the wind. But sudden see the woods above pour down another core, all helter-skelter in a drove, like that I sung before. 
Irving and terror in the van came flying all abroad, and cannon colors horse and man came tumbling to the road. Still as he fled twas Irving's cry, and his example too, Run on, my merry men, for why the shot will not go through. As when two kennels in the street, swelled with recent rain, In gushing streams together meet and seek the neighboring drain. So met these dung-born tribes in one, and swift in their career, And so to Newburgh they ran on, and all the cows got clear. Poor Parson Caldwell, all in wonder, saw the returning train, And mourned to wane the lack of plunder for them to steal again. For twas his right to steal the spoil, and to share with each commander, as he had done at Staten Island with Frostbit Alexander. In his dismay the frantic priest began to grow prophetic. You'd swore to see his laboring breast he'd taken an emetic. I view a future day, said he, brighter than this dark day is, and you shall see what you shall see, ha ha, one pretty Marquis. And he shall come to Paulus Hook, and great achievements think on, and make a bow and take a look like Satan over Lincoln and every one around his glory to see the Frenchman caper, and pretty Susan tell the story in the next Chatham paper. This solemn prophecy, of course, gave all much consolation, except to Wayne, who lost his horse upon that great occasion. His horse that carried all his prog, his military speeches, his cornstalk whiskey for his grog, blue stockings and brown beeches. And now I've closed my epic strain, I tremble as I show it, lest this same warrior drover Wayne should ever catch the poet. John Ander The last stanza was singularly prophetic. The Americans relied for the defense of the Hudson upon the impregnable position at West Point, to the command of which Benedict Arnold had been appointed in July 1780. Arnold, one of the most brilliant officers in the army, had been treated with great injustice by Congress, and to revenge himself determined to betray West Point into the hands of the British. He therefore opened communication with Clinton, and on September 21st, Major Andre was sent to confer with the traitor. While returning to the British lines the following night, he was captured by an American outpost, who searched him, discovered the papers giving the details of the plot, and took him back to the American lines refusing his offers of reward for his release. Brave Paulding and the Spy September 23, 1780 Come all you brave Americans, and unto me give ear, and I'll sing you a ditty that will your spirits cheer. Concerning a young gentleman whose age was twenty-two, he fought for North America, his heart was just and true. They took him from his dwelling, and they did him confine. They cast him in a prison, and kept him there a time. But he with resolution resolved not long to stay. He set himself at liberty, and soon he ran away. He with a scouting party went down to Terrytown, where he met a British officer, a man of high renown, who says unto these gentlemen, You're of the British cheer. I trust that you can tell me if there's any danger near. Then up stepped this young hero. John Paulding was his name. Sir, tell us where you're going, and also whence you came. I bear the British flag, sir. I've a pass to go this way. I'm on an expedition, and have no time to stay. Then round him came this company, and bid him to dismount. Come tell us where you're going. Give us a strict account. For now we are resolved that you shall ne'er pass by. Upon examination, they found he was a spy. He begged for his liberty, he pled for his discharge, and oftentimes he told them, if they'd set him at large, Here's all the gold and silver I have laid up in the store, but when I reach the city I'll give you ten times more. I scorn the gold and silver you have laid up in store, and when you get to New York you need not send us more. But you may take your sword in hand to gain your liberty, and if that you do conquer me, oh, then you shall be free. The time it is improper, our valor for to try, for if we take our swords in hand, then one of us must die. I am a man of honor, with courage true and bold, and fear not the man of clay, though he's clothed in gold. 
he saw with his conspiracy, would soon be brought to light. He begged for pen and paper, and asked leave to write. A line to General Arnold, to let him know his fate, and begged for his assistance, but now it was too late. When the news it came to Arnold, it put him in a fret. He walked the room in trouble, till tears his cheek did wet. The story soon went through the camp, and also through the fort. He called for the vulture, and sailed for New York. Now Arnold to New York has gone, a-fighting for his king, and left poor Major Andre on the gallows for to swing. When he was executed, he looked both meek and mild, and looked upon the people, and pleasantly he smiled. It moved each eye with pity, caused every heart to bleed, and every one wished him released, and Arnold in his stead. He was a man of honor, in Britain he was born, to die upon the gallows most highly did he scorn. A bumper to John Paulding, now let your voices sound, Fill up your flowing glasses, and drink his health around. Also to those young gentlemen who bore him company, Success to North America, ye sons of liberty. Arnold learned of Andre's capture just in time, To escape a British ship in the river, And Washington, arriving soon after, Prevented his treacherous disposition of the American forces From being taken advantage of by the enemy. Arnold, the Vile Traitor September 25th, 1780 Arnold, the name as heretofore shall now be Benedict no more. Since instigated by the devil, thy ways are turned from good to evil. Tis fit we brand thee with a name to suit thy infamy and shame, and since of treason thou art convicted, thy name shall be maledicted, unless by way of contradiction we style thee Britain's benediction. Such blessings she, with lavish hand, confers on this devoted land. For instance, only let us mention some proof of her benign intention, the slaves she sends us o'er the deep, and bribes to cut our throats in sleep. To take our lives and scalps away, the savage Indians keeps in pay, and Tories worse by half than they and in this class of Britain's heroes, the Tories, savage Indians, Negroes, recorded Arnold's name shall stand, while freedom's blessing crown our land, and odious for the blackest crimes, Arnold shall stink to the latest times. End of section 16「Section 17 of Poems of American History, Volume 2, The Revolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Chapter 9, Part 2 Epigram Quoth Satan to Arnold, my worthy good fellow, I love you much better than ever I did. You live like a prince, with how may get mellow, But mind that you both do just what I bid. Quoth Arnold to Satan, my friend, do not doubt me, I will strictly adhere to all your great views to you i'm devoted with all things about me you'll permit me i hope to die in my shoes new jersey gazette november one seventeen eighty andre was tried by court-martial september twenty nine and condemned to be hanged as a spy clinton with whom andre was a warm personal favorite made a desperate effort to save him but in vain, and a petition from André himself, that he might be shot instead of hanged, was also rejected. André's Request to Washington, October 1, 1780 It is not the fear of death that damps my brow, 
It is not for another breath I ask thee now. I can die with a lip unstirred, and a quiet heart. Let but this prayer be heard. Ere I depart, I can give up my mother's look, my sister's kiss. I can think of love, yet brook a death like this. I can give up the young fame I burn to win, all but the spotless name I glory in. Thine is the power to give, thine to deny. Joy for the hour I live, calmness to die. By all the brave should cherish, by my dying breath, I ask that I may perish by a soldier's death. Nathaniel Parker Willis Accordingly, on Monday, October 2, 1780, the Adjutant General of the British Army was led to the gallows and shared the fate which had befallen Nathan Hale four years before. Andre This is the place where Andre met that death, whose infamy was keenest of its throes. And in this place of bravely yielded breath, his ashes found a fifty years' repose. And then, at last, a transatlantic grave, with those who have been kings in blood or fame, as honor here some compensation gave, for that once forfeit to a hero's name. But whether in the abbey's glory laid, or on so fair but fatal tappan shore, Still at his grave have noble hearts betrayed, The loving pity and regret they bore. In view of all he lost, his youth, his love, And possibilities that wait the brave, Inward and outward bound, dim visions move, Like passing sails upon the Hudson's wave. The country's father, how do we revere, His justice, Brutus-like, in its decree, with Andre sparing mercy, still more dear, had been his name, if that indeed could be. Charlotte Fisk Bates But Arnold, the chief offender, had escaped, and a plan was set on foot to abduct him from the midst of the British and bring him back to the American lines. The execution of this plot was entrusted to John Champ a sergeant-major in Lee's cavalry. On the night of October 20, Champ mounted his horse, and seemingly deserted to the British, escaping a hot pursuit. He gained Arnold's confidence, and made every arrangement to abduct him, but was foiled at the last moment by Arnold's embarkation on an expedition to the south. Sergeant Champ, October 20, 1780 Come sheath your swords, my gallant boys, and listen to the story How Sergeant Champ, one gloomy night, set off to catch the Tory. You see the general had got mad, to think his plans were thwarted, And swore by all, both good and bad, that Arnold should be carted. So unto Lee he sent a line, and told him all his sorrow, And said that he must start the hunt, before the coming morrow. Lee found a sergeant in his camp, made up of bone and muscle, who ne'er knew fear in many a year, with Tories had a tussle. Bold Champ, when mounted on old Rip, all buttoned up from weather, sang out good-bye, cracked off his whip, and soon was in the heather. He galloped on towards Palace Hook, improving every instant, until the patrol wide awake decried him in the distance on coming up the guard called out and asked him where he's going to which he answered with his spur and left him in the mowing the bushes passed him like the wind and pebbles flew asunder the guard was left far far behind all mixed with mud and wonder lee's troops paraded all alive although twas one the morning, and counting o'er a dozen or more, one sergeant is found wanting. A little hero, full of spunk, but not so full of judgment, 
pressed Major Lee to let him go, with the bravest of his regiment. Lee summoned Cornet Middleton, expressed what was urgent, and gave him orders how to go, to catch the rambling sergeant. Then forty troopers, more or less, set off across the meander. About thirty-nine went jogging on, a following their leader. At early morn, adown a hill, they saw the sergeant sliding. So fast he went, it was not Kent, whether he's rode or riding. None looked back, but on they spurred, a gaining every minute. To see them go, t'would done you good, you thought old Satan in it. The sergeant missed him, by good luck, and took another tracing. He turned his horse from Paulus Hook, Elizabeth Town facing. It was the custom of Sir Hal to send his galleys cruising, and so it happened just then that two were at Van Dusen's. Straight unto these the sergeant went, and left old Rip all standing, awaiting for the blown cornet at Squire Van Dusen's landing. The troopers didn't gallop home, but rested from their labors, and some tis said took gingerbread and cider from the neighbors. T'was just at eve the troopers reached, the camp they left that morning, Sham's empty saddle unto Lee gave an unwelcome warning. If Sham has suffered, tis my fault, so thought the generous major, I would not have his garment touched for millions on a wager. The cornet told him all he knew, excepting of the cider. The troopers all spurred very well, but Champ was the best rider. And so it happened that brave Champ, unto Sir Hal deserted, deceiving him and you and me, and into York was flirted. He saw base Arnold in his camp, surrounded by the legion, and told him of the recent prank that threw him in that region. Then Arnold grinned and rubbed his hands, and even most choked with pleasure, not thinking Champ was all the while a taking of his measure. Come now, says he, my bold soldier, as you're within our borders, let's drink our fill, old care to kill, to-morrow you'll have orders. Full soon the British fleet set sail, say, wasn't that a pity? For thus it was brave Sergeant Champ was taken from the city. To southern climes the shipping flew, and anchored in Virginia, when Champ escaped and joined his friends among the Piccaninny. Base Arnold's head by luck was saved. Poor Andre was gibbeted. Arnold's to blame for Andre's fame, and Andre's to be pitied. After the flurry consequent upon Andre's capture and execution, affairs at New York settled back into the old routine. A sort of lethargy seemed to possess the British leaders, and the Americans grew bolder and bolder, sometimes pushing their foraging expeditions within the British lines, and on one occasion, seizing a quantity of hay and setting fire to some houses within sight of Clinton's quarters. The next day, the loyalist disgust was voiced in some verses written by Joseph Stansbury, and stuck up about the town. A New Song, 1780 Has the Marquis La Lafayette taken off all our hay yet? Says Clinton to the wise heads around him. Yes, faith, Sir Harry, each stack he did carry, and likewise the cattle confound him. Besides, he now goes just under your nose, to burn all the houses to cinder. If that be his project, it is not an object worth a great man's attempting to hinder. For forage and house, I care not a louse, for revenge let the loyalists bellow. I swear I'll not do more to keep them in humor than play on my violin cello. Since Charleston is taken, will sure save my bacon. I can live a whole year on that same, sir. Ride about all the day, at night, concert or play. So a fig for the men that they are blame, sir. If growlers complain, 
I inactive remain, Will do nothing, nor let any others. Tis sure no new thing, To serve thus our king, Witness Burgoyne, And two famous brothers. Joseph Stansbury Another of Stansbury's lyrics, and perhaps the best he ever wrote, is The Lords of the Main, intended for the use of the British sailors then engaged in fighting their ancient foes, France and Spain. The Lords of the Main, 1780 When faction in league with the treacherous Gaul began to look big and paraded in state, a meeting was held a credulity hall, and echo proclaimed their ally good and great. By sea and by land such wonders are planned, no less than the bold British lion to chain. Well hove, says Jack Lanyard, French Congo and Spaniard, have at you, remember, we're lords of the main. Lords of the main, I lords of the main, the tars of old England are lords of the main. Though party contention a while may perplex, And lenity held us in doubtful suspense, If perfidy rouse, or ingratitude vex, In defiance of hell, will chastise the offence. When danger alarms, tis then that in arms, United we rush on the foe with disdain. And when the storm rages, it only presages, Fresh triumphs to Britons, as lords of the main. Lords of the main, aye, lords of the main, Let thunder proclaim it, we're lords of the main. Then Britons strike home, make sure of your blow, The chase is in view, never mind a lee shore, With vengeance or take the confederate foe, Tis now we may rival our heroes of yore. Brave Anson and Drake, Hawk, Russell, and Blake, With ardor like yours, we defy France and Spain, Combining with treason, they're deaf to all reason. Once more let them feel we are lords of the main. Lords of the main, aye, lords of the main. The firstborn of Neptune are lords of the main. Joseph Stansbury among the desperate and foolish expedients to which the British resorted in the hope of winning America back to her allegiance was that of sending Prince William Henry, afterwards William IV, to New York in 1781. The Tory authorities of the city overwhelmed him with adulation, but in the country at large his visit excited only derision. The Royal Adventurer 1781. Prince William of the Brunswick race, to witness George's sad disgrace, the royal lad came over, rebels to kill by right divine, derived from that illustrious line. The beggars of Hanover, so many chiefs got broken pates in vanquishing the rebel states. So many nobles fell, that George the Third in passion cried, our royal blood must now be tried. Tis that must break the spell. To you, the fat pot valiant swain, to Digby said, dear friend of mine, to you I trust my boy. The rebel tribes shall quake with fears. Rebellion die when he appears. My Tories leap with joy. So said, so done, the lad was sent, but never reached the continent. An island held him fast, yet there his friends danced rigadoons. The Hessians sung in high Dutch tunes. Prince William's come at last, Prince William's come, the Briton cried. Our labors now will be repaid, dominion be restored. Our monarch is in William seen, he is the image of our queen. Let William be adored. The Tories came with long address. With poems groaned the royal press, And all in William's praise. The youth astonished looked about, To find their vast dominions out. Then answered in amaze, Where all your vast domain can be, Friends, for my soul I cannot see, Tis but an empty name, Three wasted islands and a town, In rubbish buried, 
half burnt down is all that we can claim i am of royal birth tis true but what my sons can princes do no armies to command cornwallis conquered and distressed sir henry clinton grown a jest i curse and quit the land philip Frenot. the war in the north thereafter was confined on the part of the british to predatory raids along the coasts of which the descent on middlesex is a fair example on the afternoon of july twenty two seventeen eighty one a party of royalist refugees surrounded the church where the people of middlesex were at prayer and took fifty of them captive among them schoolmaster st john of norwalk the author of the following ingenuous ballad describing their experiences the descent on middlesex july twenty two seventeen eighty one july the twenty second day the precise hour i will not say in seventeen hundred and eighty one a horrid action was begun while to the lord they sing and pray the tories who in ambush lay beset the house with brazen face at middlesex it was the place a guard was placed the house before likewise behind and at each door then void of shame those men of sin the sacred temple entered in the reverend mather closed his book how did the congregation look those demons plundered all they could either in silver or in gold the silver buckles which we use both at the knees and on the shoes these caitiffs took them in their rage had no respect for sex or age as they were searching all around the several silver watches found while well, they who placed as guards without like raging devils ranged about run forty horses to the shore not many either less or more with bridles saddles pillions on in a few minutes all was done the men from hence they took away upon that awful sacred day was forty-eight besides two more they chanced to find upon the shore on board the shipping they were sent their money gone and spirits spent and greatly fearing their sad end this wicked seizure did portend they hoisted sail the sound they crossed and near lloyd's neck they anchored first twas here the tories felt twas wrong to bring so many men along then every man must tell his name a list they took and kept the same when twenty-four of fifty men were ordered to go home again the twenty-six who stayed behind most cruelly they were confined on board the brig were ordered quick and then confined beneath the deck a dismal hole with filth besmeared but twas no more than what we feared sad the confinement dark the night but then the devil thought twas right but to return whence i left off they at our misery made a scoff like raving madmen tore about swearing they'd take our vitals out they said no quarter they would give nor let a cursed rebel live but with their joints in pieces cut then round the deck like turkeys strut july the fourth and twentieth day we all marched off to oyster bay to increase our pains and make it worse they ironed just six pair of us but as they wanted just one pair an iron stirrup lying there was taken and on anvil laid on which they with a hammer paid and as they beat it inch by inch they bruised their wrists at which they flinch these wretched caitiffs standing by would laugh to hear the sufferers cry although to call them not by name from fairfield county many came and were delighted with the rout to see the rebels kicked about at night we travelled in the rain all begged for shelter but in vain though almost naked to the skin a dismal pickle we were in then to the halfway house we came the halfway house tis called by name and there we found a soul's relief 
we almost missed our dreadful grief the people generously behaved made a good fire some brandy gave of which we greatly stood in need as we were wet and cold indeed but ere the house we did attain we trembled so with cold and rain our irons jingled well they might we shivered so that stormy night in half an hour or thereabout the orders were come all turn out ye rebel prisoners shabby crew to loiter thus will never do twas now about the break of day when all were forced to march away with what they ordered we complied though cold nor yet one quarter dried we made a halt one half mile short of what is termed brooklyn's fort where all were hurried through the street some overtook us some we met we now traversing the parade the awful figure which we made caused laughter mirth and merriment and some would curse us as we went their grandest fort was now hard by us they showed us that to terrify us they showed us all their bulwarks there to let be known how strong they were just then the tory drums did sound and pipes rang out a warlike round supposing we must thence conclude that britain ne'er could be subdued up to the guard-house we were led where each received a crumb of bread not quite one mouthful i believe for every man we did receive in boats the ferry soon we passed and at new york arrived at last as through the streets we passed along ten thousand curses round us rang but some would laugh and some would sneer and some would grin and others leer a mixed mob a medley crew i guessed as e'er the devil knew to the provost we then were hauled though we of war were prisoners called our irons now were ordered off and we were left to sneeze and cough but oh what company we found with great surprise we looked around i must conclude that in that place we found the worst of adam's race thieves murderers and pickpockets too and everything that's bad they do one of our men found to his cost three pounds york money he had lost they picked his pocket quite before we had been there one single hour and while he looked o'er and o'er the vagrants from him stole some more we soon found out but thought it strange we never were to be exchanged by a cartel but for some men whom they desired to have again a pack with whom they well agree were called the loyal company or loyalists associated as by themselves incorporated our food was called two-thirds in weight of what a soldier has to eat we had no blankets in our need till a kind friend did intercede said he the prisoners suffer so tis quite unkind and cruel too i'm sure it makes my heart to bleed so great their hardship and their need well to us was the event fine blankets soon to us were sent small the allowance very small but better far than none at all an oaken plank it was our bed an oaken pillow for the head and room as scanty as our meals for we lay crowded head and heels in seven days or thereabout one jonas weed was taken out and to his friends he was resigned but many still were kept behind soon after this some were paroled too tedious wholly to be told and some from bondage were unstrung whose awful sufferings can't be sung the dread smallpox to some they gave nor tried at all their lives to save but rather sought their desolation as they denied em inoculation to the smallpox there did succeed a putrid fever bad indeed as they before were weak and spent soon from the stage of life they went for wood we greatly stood in need for which we earnestly did plead but one-tenth part of what we wanted of wood to us was never granted 
the boiling kettles which we had were wanting covers good or bad the worst of rum that could be bought for a great price to us was brought for bread and milk and sugar too we had to pay four times their due while cash and clothing which were sent those wretched creatures did prevent some time it was in dark november but just the day i can't remember full forty of us were confined in a small room both damp and blind because there had been two or three who were not of our company who did attempt the other day the tories said to get away in eighteen days we were exchanged and through the town allowed to range of twenty-five that were taen but just nineteen reached home again four days before december's gone in seventeen hundred eighty one i hailed the place where months before the tories took me from the shore peter st john end of section seventeen recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida Section 18 of Poems of American History, Volume 2, The Revolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ed Humple. Chapter 10. The War in the South. Part 1. After the surrender of Burgoyne, the military attitude of the British in the northern states was, as has been seen, purely defensive, but the southern states were the scene of vigorous fighting. The king had set his heart on the reduction of Georgia and the Carolinas, and it looked for a time as though he would be gratified. In General Augustine Prevost there was at last found a man after the king's own heart, and his barbarities and vandalism were among the most monstrous of the war. General Benjamin Lincoln was sent south to oppose him, and was soon joined by Count Pulaski and his legion. Hymn of the Moravian Nuns of Bethlehem At the Consecration of Pulaski's Banner When the dying flame of day Through the chancel shot its ray, Far the glimmering tapers shed Faint light on the cowled head, And the censer burning swung where before the altar hung the crimson banner that with prayer had been consecrated there. And the nun's sweet hymn was heard the while, sung low in the dim mysterious aisle. Take thy banner, may it wave proudly o'er the good and brave, when the battle's distant wail breaks the sabbath of our veil, when the clarion's music thrills to the hearts of these lone hills, when the spear in conflict shakes and the strong lance shivering breaks. Take thy banner, and beneath the battle cloud's encircling wreath, guard it till our homes are free, guard it, God will prosper thee, in the dark and trying hour, in the breaking forth of power, in the rush of steeds and men, his right hand will shield thee then. Take thy banner. But when night closes round the ghastly fight, if the vanished warrior bow, spare him. By our holy vow, by our prayers and many tears, by the mercy that endears, spare him. He our love hath shared. Spare him as thou wouldst be spared. Take thy banner, and if e'er thou shouldst press the soldier's bier, and the muffled drum should beat to the tread of mournful feet, then this crimson flag shall be martial cloak and shroud for thee. The warrior took that banner proud, and it was his martial cloak and shroud. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow In August 1779, the French fleet under de Esting appeared off the coast of Georgia, and plans were made for the capture of Savannah. The place was closely invested by the French and Americans, and for nearly a month the siege was carried vigorously on. But de Esting grew impatient, and October 9th an attempt was made to carry the place by storm. 
the assailants were totally defeated, losing more than a thousand men, while the British loss was only fifty-five. Count Pulaski was among the slain. About Savannah October ninth, 1779 Come let us rejoice, with heart and with voice, her triumphs let loyalty show, sir. While bumpers go round, re-echo the sound, Huzzah for the king and prevost, sir. With warlike parade and his Irish brigade, His ships in his spruce Gallic hosts, sir. As proud as an elf, Destain came himself, And landed on George's coast, sir. There joining a band under Lincoln's command, Of rebels and traitors and Whigs, sir. Against the town of Savannah he planted his banner, And then he felt wondrous big, sir. With thundering of guns and bursting of bombs, he thought to have frightened our boys, sir. But amidst all their din, brave Maitland pushed in, and Moncrief cried, A fig for your noise, sir. Chagrined at delay, he meant not to stay. The Count formed his troops in the morn, sir. Van Center in rear marched up without fear, cocksure of success by a storm, sir. Though rude was the shock, unmoved as a rock, stood our firm British bands to their works, sir. While the brave German corps and Americans bore their parts as intrepid as Turks, sir. Then muskets did rattle, fierce raged the battle, grape shot it flew thicker than hail, sir. The ditch filled with slain, blood dyed all the plain, when rebels and French turned tail, sir. See, see how they run, Lord, what glorious fun, how they tumble by cannon mowed down, sir. Brains fly all around, dying screeches resound, and mangled limbs cover the ground, sir. There Pulaski fell, that imp of old Bell, who attempted to murder his king, sir. But now he is gone, whence he'll never return, but will make hell with treason to ring, sir. To Charleston with fear the rebels repair, Destang scampers back to his boat, sir, each blaming the other, each cursing his brother, and may they cut each other's throats, sir. Scarce three thousand men the town did maintain gets three times their number of foes, sir, who left on the plain of wounded and slain three thousand to fatten the crows, sir. Three thousand, no less, for the rebels confess some loss, as you very well know, sir. Then let bumpers go round and re-echo the sound. Huzzah for the king and prevost, sir. As soon as Clinton learned of this victory, he determined to capture Charleston, where General Lincoln was stationed with 3,000 men. Lincoln decided to withstand a siege, hoping for reinforcements, but none came, and on May 12, 1780, to avoid a wanton waste of life, he surrendered his army and the city to the British. A Song About Charleston May 12, 1780 King Hancock sat in regal state, and big with pride and vainly great, addressed his rebel crew. These haughty Britons soon shall yield the boasted honors of the field, while our brave sons pursue. Six thousand fighting men or more protect the Carolina shore, and freedom will defend. And stubborn Britons soon shall feel against Charleston and hearts of steel how vainly they contend. But ere he spake, in dread array, To rebel foes, ill-fated day, The British boys appear. Their mean with martial ardor fired, And by their country's wrongs inspired, Shook Lincoln's heart with fear. See Clinton brave, serene, and great, For mighty deeds revered by fate, Direct the thundering fight while Mars, propitious god of war, looks down from his triumphant car with wonder and delight. Clinton, he cries, the palm is thine, midst heroes thou wert born to shine, a great immortal name. And Cornwallis' mighty deeds appear, conspicuous each revolving year, the pledge of future fame. Our tars their share of glories won, for they among the bravest shone, undaunted, firm, and bold. Whene'er engaged their ardor showed, hearts with which native valor glowed, hearts of true British mold. The whole of South Carolina was soon overrun by the British. Estates were confiscated, houses were burned, and alleged traitors hanged without trial. Organized resistance was impossible. 
but there soon sprang up in the state a number of partisan leaders. Foremost among them was Francis Marion, perhaps the most picturesque figure of the Revolution. No act of cruelty ever sullied the brightness of his fame, but no partisan leader excelled him in ability to distress the enemy in legitimate warfare. THE SWAMP FOX we follow where the swamp fox guides, his friends and merry men are we, and when the troop of Tarleton rides, we burrow in the cypress tree. The turfy hammock is our bed, our home is in the red deer's den, our roof the treetop overhead, for we are wild and hunted men. We fly by day and shun its light, but prompt to strike the sudden blow, we mount and start with early night, and through the forest track our foe and soon he hears our charger's leap and flashing sabre blinds his eyes and ere he drives away his sleep and rushes from his camp he dies free bridle bit good gallant steed that will not ask a kind caress to swim the santy at our need when on his heels the foemen press the true heart and the ready hand the spirit stubborn to be free the twisted boar the smiting brand and we are marion's men you see now light the fire and cook the meal the last perhaps that we shall taste i hear the swamp fox round us steal and that's a sign we move in haste he whistles to the scouts and hark you hear his order calm and low come wave your torch across the dark and let us see the boys that go we may not see their forms again god help em should they find the strife for they are strong and fearless men and make no coward terms for life They'll fight as long as Marion bids, and when he speaks the word to shy, then, not till then, they turn their steeds through thickening shade and swamp to fly. Now stir the line and lie at ease. The scouts are gone, and on the brush I see the colonel bend his knee to take his slumbers too. But hush! He's praying, comrades. Tis not strange, the man that's fighting day by day may well when night comes take a change and down upon his knees to pray break up that hoe cake boys and hand the sly and silent jug that's there i love not it should idly stand when marion's men have need of cheer tis seldom that our luck affords a stuff like this we just have quaffed and dry potatoes on our boards may always call for such a draught now pile the brush and roll the log hard pillow but a soldier's head that's half the time in break and bog must never think of softer bed the owl is hooting to the night the cooter crawling o'er the bank and in the pond the flashing light tells where the alligator sank what tis the signal start so soon and through the santee swamp so deep without the aid of friendly moon and we heaven help us half asleep but courage comrades marion leads the swamp fox takes us out to-night so clear your swords and spur your steeds there's goodly chance i think of fight we follow where the swamp fox guides we leave the swamp and cypress tree our spurs are in our coursers sides and ready for the strife are we the tory camp is now in sight and there he cowers within his den he hears our shouts he dreads the fight he fears and flies from marion's men William Gilmore Sims Song of Marion's Men Our band is few, but true and tried, our leader frank and bold. The British soldier trembles when Marion's name is told. Our fortress is the good greenwood, our tent the cypress tree. We know the forest round us as seamen know the sea. We know its walls of thorny vines, its glades of reedy grass, its safe and silent islands within the deep morass. Woe to the English soldiery that little dread us near. On them shall light at midnight a strange and sudden fear. When waking to their tents on fire, they grasp their arms in vain, and they who stand to face us are beat to earth again. And they who fly in terror deem a mighty host behind, And hear the tramp of thousands upon the hollow wind. Then sweet the hour that brings release from danger and from toil, We talk the battle over, we share the battle's spoil, 
the woodland rings with laugh and shout as if a hunt were up and woodland flowers are gathered to crown the soldier's cup with merry songs we mock the wind that in the pine top grieves and slumber long and sweetly on beds of oaken leaves well knows the fair and friendly moon the band that marion leads the glitter of their rifles the scampering of their steeds tis life to guide the fiery barb across the moonlight plain tis life to feel the night wind that lifts his tossing mane a moment in the british camp a moment and away back to the pathless forest before the peep of day grave men there are by broad santee grave men with hoary hairs their hearts are all with marion for marion are their prayers and lovely ladies greet our band with kindliest welcoming with smiles like those of summer and tears like those of spring for them we wear these trusty arms and lay them down no more till we have driven the britain forever from our shore william cullen bryant among the members of marion's band was a gigantic scotsman named macdonald the hero of many daring escapades of which his raid through georgetown south carolina with only four troopers was the most remarkable georgetown was a fortified place defended by a garrison of three hundred men macdonald's raid 1780 i remember it well twas a morn dull and gray and the legion lay idle and listless that day a thin drizzle of rain piercing chill to the soul and with not a spare bumper to brighten the bowl when macdonald arose and unsheathing his blade cried who'll back me brave comrades i'm hot for a raid let the carbines be loaded the war harness ring then swift death to the redcoats and down with the king we leaped up at his summons all eager and bright to our fingertips thrilling to join him in fight yet he chose from our numbers four men and no more stalwart brothers quoth he you'll be strong as fourscore if you follow me fast wheresoever i lead with keen sword and true pistol staunch heart and bold steed let the weapons be loaded the bridle bits ring then swift death to the redcoats and down with the king in a trice we were mounted macdonald's tall form seated firm in the saddle his face like a storm when the clouds on ben lomond hang heavy and stark and the red veins of lightning pulse hot through the dark his left hand on his sword belt his right lifted free with a prick from the spurred heel a touch from the knee his lie there was off like an eagle on wing ha death death to the redcoats and down with the king twas three leagues to the town where in insolent pride of their disciplined numbers their works strong and wide the big britons oblivious of warfare and arms a soft dolce were wrapped in not dreaming of harms when fierce yells as if borne by some fiend-ridden rout with strange cheer after cheer are heard echoing without over which like the blast of ten trumpeters ring death death to the redcoats and down with the king such a tumult we raised with steel hoof-stroke and shout that the foemen made straight for their inmost redoubt and therein with pale lips and cowed spirits quoth they lord the whole rebel army assaults us to-day are the works think you strong god of heaven what a din tis the front wall besieged have the rebels rushed in it must be for hark hark to that jubilant ring of death to the redcoats and down with the king meanwhile through the town like a whirlwind we sped and ere long be assured that our broadswords were red and the ground here and there by an ominous stain showed how the stark soldier beside it was slain a fat sergeant major who yawed like a goose with his waddling bow legs and his trappings all loose by one backhanded blow the macdonald cuts down to the shoulder blade cleaving him sheer through the crown and the last words that greet his dim consciousness ring with death death to the redcoats and down with the king having cleared all the streets not an enemy left whose heart was unpierced or whose headpiece uncleft what should we do next but careless and calm as if we were scenting a summer morn's balm mid a land of pure peace just serenely dropped down on the few constant friends who still stopped in the town what welcome they gave us one dear little thing as i kissed her sweet lips did i dream of the king of the king or his minions no 
War and its scars seemed as distant just then as the fierce front of Mars, from a love-girdled earth. But alack, on our bliss, on the close claps of arms, and kiss showering on kiss, broke the rude brute of battle, the rush thick and fast, of the Britons made ware of our rash ruse at last. So we haste to our coursers, yet flying we fling, the old watchwords abroad, down with redcoats and king. As we scampered pell-mell, o'er the hard-beaten track, we had traversed that morn, we glanced momently back, and beheld their long earthworks all compassed in flame, with a vile plunge and hiss the huge musket-balls came, and the soil was ploughed up, and the space twixt the trees seemed to hum with the war-song of Brobdingnag bees. Yet above them, beyond them, victoriously ring the shouts, Death to the Redcoats, and down with the King. Ah, that was a feat, lads, to boast of. What men, like you weaklings today, durst cope with us then? Though I say it who should not, I am ready to vow, I o'ermatch a half-score of your fops even now, the poor puny prigs, mincing up, mincing down, through the whole wasted day, the thronged streets of the town. Why, their dainty white necks, t'were but pastime to ring. Ay, my muscles are firm still. I fought gainst the king. Dare you doubt it? Well, give me the weightiest of all, the sheathed sabbards that hang there, unlooped on the wall. Hurl the scabbard aside, yield the blade to my clasp. Do you see, with one hand, how I poise it and grasp the rough iron-bound hilt? With this long hissing sweep, I have smitten full many a foeman with sleep. That forlorn final sleep, God, what memories cling to those gallant old times when we fought against the king. Paul Hamilton Hayne Second alone to Marion in this wild warfare was Thomas Sumter, a Virginian, destined to serve his country in other ways. During the summer of 1780, he kept up so brisk a guerrilla warfare that Cornwallis called him the greatest plague in the country. Sumter's Band When Carolina's hope grew pale before the British lion's tread, and freedom's sigh in every gale was heard above her martyred dead, when from her mountain heights subdued, in pride of place forbid to soar, her eagle banner, quenched in blood, lay sullen on the indignant shore. Breathing revenge, invoking doom, tyrant upon thy purple host, where all stood wrapped in steadfast gloom, and silence brooded o'er her coast. Stealthy as when, from thicket done, the Indian springs upon his bow, uprose South Mount thy warrior son, and headlong darted on the foe. Not in the pride of war he came, with bugle note and banner high, and nodding plume and steel of flame, read battle's gorgeous panoply. With followers few, but undismayed, each change and chance of fate withstood. Beneath her sunshine and her shade, the same heroic brotherhood. From secret nook in other land, emerging fleet along the pine, prone down he flew before his band, like eagle on the British line. Catacoba's waters smiled again, to see her sumpter's soul in arms, and issuing from each glade and glen, rekindled by war's fierce alarms. Thronged hundreds through the solitude of the wild forest to the call of him whose spirit unsubdued fresh impulse gave to each, to all. By day the burning sands they ply, night sees them in the fell ravine, familiar to each follower's eye, the tangled brake, the hall of green. Roused by their tread from covert deep, springs the gaunt wolf, and thus while near is heard forbidding thought of sleep the rattling serpent's song of fear. Before or break of early morn, or fox looks out from copse to close, before the hunter winds his horn, Sumter's already on his foes. He beat them back beneath the flame of valor quailing o'er the shock, and carved at last the hero's name upon the glorious hanging rock. And time, that shades or sears the wreath where glory binds the soldier's brow, kept bright her Sumter's fame in death, his hour of proudest triumph now. And ne'er shall tyrant tread the shore, where Sumter bled, nor bled in vain. A thousand hearts shall break before they wear the oppressor's chains again. O oh, never can thy sons forget the mighty lessons taught by thee, since treasured by the eternal debt, their watchword is thy memory. J. W. Simmons
South Carolina was too important to be left dependent upon the skill of partisan commanders, and General Gates was hurried to the scene, only to be ignominiously defeated by Cornwallis at Camden, and routed with the loss of two thousand men. Cornwallis, elated by this victory, started for North Carolina, but the country was thoroughly aroused. In October 7th, a detachment of 1,200 men was brought to bay on King's Mountain and either killed or captured. The Battle of King's Mountain October 7th, 1780 T'was on a pleasant mountain the Tory heathens lay, with a doughty major at their head, one Ferguson, they say. Cornwallis had detached him, a thieving for to go, and catch the Carolina men or bring the rebels low. The scamp had ranged the country in search of royal aid, and with his owls perched on high and taught them all his trade. But ah, that fatal morning, when Shelby brave drew near, tis certainly a warning that ministers should hear. And Campbell and Cleveland and Colonel Severe, each with a band of gallant men, to Ferguson appear. Just as the sun was setting, behind the western hills, just then our trusty rifles sent a dose of leaden pills. Up, up the steep together, brave Williams led his troop, and joined by Winston bold and true, disturbed the Tory coop. The royal slaves, the royal owls, flew high on every hand, but soon they settled, gave a howl, and quartered to Cleveland. I shall not tell the number of Tories slain that day, but surely it is certain that none did run away, for all that were a-living were happy to give up, so let us make thanksgiving and pass the bright tin cup. To all the brave regiments, let's toast them for their health, and may our good country have quietude and wealth. End of section 18section 19 of poems of american history volume 2 the revolution this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by patrick barrett chapter 10 the war in the south part 2 this brilliant victory restored hope to the patriots of the south and cornwallis soon found himself in a dangerous position he was finally forced to detach Tarleton, with 1,100 men, to attack Daniel Morgan's little army of 900 men, which was threatening his line of communications. On Tarleton's approach, Morgan retreated to a grazing ground known as the Cowpens, near King's Mountain, and here, on January 17, 1781, Tarleton attacked him, only to be completely routed. The Battle of the Cowpens, January 17, 1781 to the cowpens riding proudly, boasting loudly, rebels scorning, Tarleton hurried hot and eager for the fight. From the cowpens, sore confounded on that January morning, Tarleton hurried somewhat faster, fain to save himself by flight. In the morn he scorned us rarely, but he fairly found his error, when his force was made our ready blows to feel. When his horsemen and his footmen fled in wild and pallid terror, at the leaping of our bullets and the sweeping of our steel. All the day before we fled them, and we led them to pursue us, then at night on Thickety Mountain made our camp. There we lay upon our rifles, slumber quickly coming to us, spite the crackling of our campfires and our sentries' heavy tramp. Morning on the mountain border ranged in order found our forces, ere our scouts announced the coming of the foe. While the hoar-frost lying near us and the distant water-courses gleamed like silver in the sunlight, seemed like silver in their glow. Morgan ranged us there to meet them and to greet them with such favor that they scarce would care to follow us again. In the rear the Continentals, none were readier nor braver. In the van with ready rifles, steady, stern, our mountain men. Washington, our trooper peerless, gay and fearless with his forces, waiting panther-like upon the foe to fall. Formed upon the slope behind us, where, on raw-boned country horses, sat the sudden summoned levies brought from Georgia by McCall. Soon we heard a distant drumming, nearer coming, slow advancing. It was then upon the very nick of nine. 
Soon upon the road from Spartanburg we saw their bayonets glancing, and the morning sunlight playing on their swaying scarlet line. In the distance seen so dimly they looked grimly coming nearer, there was not about them fearful after all, until some one near me spoke in voice then falling water clearer, Tarleton's quarter is the sword blade, Tarleton's mercy is the ball. Then the memory came unto me, heavy, gloomy, of my brother, who was slain while asking quarter at their hand, of that morning when was driven forth my sister and my mother from our cabin in the valley by the spoilers of the land. I remembered of my brother slain, my mother spurned and beaten, of my sister in her beauty brought to shame, of the wretch's jeers and laughter as from mud-sill up to rafter of the stripped and plundered cabin leapt the fierce, consuming flame. But that memory had no power there in that hour there to depress me. No, it stirred within my spirit fiercer ire, and I gripped my sword-hilt firmer, and my arm and heart grew stronger, and I longed to meet the wronger on the sea of steel and fire. On they came, our might disdaining, where the raining bullets leaden pattered fast from scattered rifles on each wing. Here and there went down a foeman, and the ground began to redden, and they drew them back a moment like the tiger ere his spring. Then said Morgan, ball and powder kill much prouder men than George's, on your rifles and a careful aim rely. They were trained in many battles, we in workshops, fields, and forges, but we have our homes to fight for, and we do not fear to die. Though our leader's words we cheered not, yet we feared not, we awaited. Strong of heart, the threatened onset, and it came. Up the sloping hillside swiftly rushed the foe so fiercely hated. On they came with gleaming bayonet mid the cannon's smoke and flame. At their head rode Tarleton proudly, ringing loudly o'er the yelling. Of his men we heard his voice's brazen tone. With his dark eyes flashing fiercely, and his somber features telling in their look the pride that filled him as the champion of the throne. On they pressed, when sudden flashing, ringing, crashing, came the firing of our forward line upon their close-set ranks. Then, at coming of their steel, which moved with steadiness untiring, fled our mountaineers, reforming in good order on our flanks. Then the combat's raging anger, din and clangor, round and o'er us, filled the forest, stirred the air, and shook the ground. Charged with thunder tramp the horsemen, while their sabers shone before us, gleaming lightly, stemming brightly through the smoky cloud around. Through the pines and oaks resounding, madly bounding from the mountain, leapt the rattle of the battle and the roar. Fierce the hand-to-hand -hand engaging, and the human freshet raging, of the surging current urging past a dark and bloody shore. Soon the course of fight was altered, soon they faltered at the leaden storm that smote them, and we saw their center swerve. Tarleton's eye flashed fierce in anger, Tarleton's face began to redden. Tarleton gave the closing order, bring to action the reserve. Up the slope his legion thundered, full three hundred fiercely spurring, Cheering lustily, they fell upon our ranks, and their worn and wearied comrades, at the sound so spirit-stirring, felt a thrill of hope and courage pass along their shattered ranks. By the wind the smoke-cloud lifted, lightly drifted to the norward, and displayed in all their pride the scarlet foe. We beheld them with a steady tramp and fearless moving forward, with their banners proudly waving and their bayonets leveled low. Morgan gave his order clearly, fall back nearly to the border of the hill and let the enemy come nigher. Oh, they thought we had retreated, and they charged in fierce disorder when out rang the voice of Howard, to the right, about, face, fire. Then upon our very wheeling came the peeling of our volley, and our balls made red a pathway down the hill. Broke the foe and shrank and cowered, rang again the voice of Howard, give the hireling dogs the bayonet, and we did it with a will. In the meanwhile, one red-coat troop, unnoted, riding faster than their comrades on our rear in fury bore. But the light horse led by Washington soon brought it to disaster, for they shattered it and scattered it, and smote it fast and sore. Like a herd of startled cattle from the battlefield we drove them, in disorder down the mill-gap road they fled. 
Tarleton led them in the racing, fast he fled before our chasing, and he stopped not for the dying, and he stayed not for the dead. Down the mill-gap road they scurried, and they hurried with such fleetness we had never seen such running in our lives. Ran they swifter than of seeking homes to taste domestic sweetness, having many years been parted from their children and their wives. Ah, for some no wife to meet them, child to greet them, friend to shield them, to their home or ocean never sailing back. After them the red avengers, bitter hate for death had sealed them, yelped the dark and red-eyed sleuth-hound unrelenting on their track. In their midst I saw one trooper, and around his waist I noted tied a simple silken scarf of blue and white. When my vision grasped it clearly to my hatred, I devoted him from all the hireling wretches who were mingled there in flight. For that token in the summer had been from our cabin taken by the robber hands of wrongers of my kin. T'was my sister's. For the moment things around me were forsaken, I was blind to fleeing foemen, I was deaf to battle's din. Olden comrades round me lying dead or dying were unheeded, vain to me they looked for succor in their need. O'er the courses of the soldiers through the gory pools I speeded, driving rowel deep my spurs within my madly bounding steed. As I came he turned, and staring at my glaring eyes he shivered, Pallid fear went quickly o'er his features grim. As he grasped his sword in terror, every nerve within him quivered, for his guilty spirit told him why I solely sought for him. Though the smoke I dealt he parried, onward carried, down I bore him, horse and rider down together went the twain. Quarter, he, that scarf had doomed him, stood a son and brother o'er him down through plume and brass and leather went my sabre to the brain ha no music like that crushing through the skull bone to the brain thomas dunn english tarleton's defeat deprived cornwallis of nearly a third of his forces and his situation became more desperate than ever he kept on across North Carolina and engaged Green in an indecisive action at Guilford Courthouse on March 15th, and then retreated to Wilmington. Green, with splendid strategy, started at once for South Carolina, captured nearly all the forts there in British hands, and on September 8th fell upon the British at Utah Springs, compelling them to retreat to Charleston. The Battle of Utah, September 8th, 1781 Hark, tis the voice of the mountain, and it speaks to our heart in its pride, as it tells of the bearing of heroes who compassed its summits and died. How they gathered to strife as the eagles when the foemen had clambered the height, how with scent keen and eager as beagles they hunted him down for the fight. Hark, through the gorge of the valley, tis the bugle that tells of the foe. Our own quickly sounds for the rally, and we snatch down the rifle and go. As the hunter who hears of the panther each arms him and leaps to his steed, rides forth through the desolate anter with his knife and his rifle at need. From a thousand deep gorges they gather, from the cot lowly perched by the rill, the cabin half hid in the heather, neath the crag which the eagle keeps still. Each lonely at first in his roaming till the veil to the sight opens fair, and he sees the low cot through the gloaming when his bugle gives tongue to the air. Thus a thousand brave hunters assemble for the hunt of the insolent foe, and soon shall his myrmidons tremble neath the shock of the thunderbolt's blow. Down the lone heights now they wind together, as the mountain brooks flow to the vale, and now, as they group on the heather, the keen scout delivers his tale. The British, the Tories are on us, and now is the moment to prove to the women whose virtues have won us that our virtues are worthy their love. They have swept the vast valleys below us with fire to the hills from the sea. And here would they seek to o'erthrow us in a realm which our eagle makes free. No war council suffered to trifle with the hours devote to the deed. Swift followed the grasp of the rifle, swift followed the bound to the steed. And soon to the eyes of our yeomen, all panting with rage at the sight, gleamed the long wavy tents of the foeman as he lay in his camp on the height. Grim dashed they away as they bounded, the hunters to hem in the prey, and with Deckard's long rifles surrounded, then the British rose fast to the fray. And never with arms of more vigor did their bayonets press through the strife. 
where with every swift pull of the trigger the sharpshooters dashed out a life. "'Twas the meeting of eagles and lions, "'twas the rushing of tempests and waves, "'insolent triumph gainst patriot defiance, "'born freemen gainst sycophant slaves. "'Scotch Ferguson sounding his whistle "'as from danger to danger he flies, "'feels the moral that lies in Scotch thistle, "'with its touch-me-who-dare, and he dies. "'An hour and the battle is over, the eagles are rending the prey. The serpents seek flight into cover, but the terror still stands in the way. More dreadful the doom that on treason avenges the wrongs of the state. And the oak tree for many a season bears fruits for the vultures of fate. William Gilmore Sims Utah Springs, to the memory of the brave Americans under General Green in South Carolina, who fell in the action of September 8, 1781, at Utah Springs. At Utah Springs the valiant died, their limbs with dust are covered o'er. Weep on, ye springs, your fearful tide, how many heroes are no more. If in this wreck of ruin they can yet be thought to claim a tear, O smite thy gentle breast and say, the friends of freedom slumber here. Thou who shalt trace this bloody plain, if goodness rules thy generous breast, sigh for the wasted rural rain, sigh for the shepherds sunk to rest. Stranger, their humble graves adorn, you too may fall and ask a tear. Tis not the beauty of the morn that proves the evening shall be clear. They saw their injured country's woe, the flaming town, the wasted field, then rushed to meet the insulting foe. They took the spear but left the shield. Led by thy conquering genius green, the Britons they compelled to fly. None distant viewed the fatal plain, none grieved in such a cause to die. But like the Parthians, famed of old, who flying still their arrows threw, those routed Britons, full as bold, retreated and retreating slew. Now rest in peace, our patriot band, though far from nature's limits thrown. We trust they find a happier land, a brighter sunshine of their own. Philip Freneau Cornwallis, meanwhile, had marched off toward Virginia, reaching Petersburg on May 20th, 1781, joining the British forces there and raising his army to 5,000 men. He marched down the peninsula and established himself at Yorktown, adding the garrison of Portsmouth to his army so that it numbered over 7,000 men. The Dance Cornwallis led a country dance, the like was never seen, sir, much retrograde and much advance, and all with General Green, sir. They rambled up and rambled down, joined hands, then off they run, sir, our General Green to Charlestown, the Earl to Wilmington, sir. Green in the south then danced a set, and got a mighty name, sir. Cornwallis jigged with young Fayette, but suffered in his fame, sir. Then down he figured to the shore, most like a lordly dancer, and on his courtly honor swore he would no more advance, sir. Quoth he, my guards are weary grown with footing country dances. They never at St. James shone at capers, kicks, or prances. Though men so gallant ne'er were seen while sauntering on parade, sir, or wriggling o'er the park's smooth green, or at a masquerade, sir. Yet are red heels and long lace skirts for stumps and briars meet, sir? Or stand they chance with hunting shirts, or hardy veteran feet, sir? Now housed in York, he challenged all, at minuet or a la monde, and lessons for a courtly ball his guards by day and night conned. This challenge known, full soon there came a set who had the bon ton, de Grasse and Rochambeau, whose fame fut brilliant pour un long temps. And Washington, Columbia's son, whom easy nature taught, sir, that grace which can't by pains be won, or Plutus' gold be bought, sir. Now hand in hand they circle round this ever-dancing peer, sir. Their gentle movements soon confound the earl as they draw near, sir. His music soon forgets to play, his feet can move no more, sir. And all his bands now curse the day they jigged to our shore, sir. Now Tories all, what can ye say? Come, is this not a griper, that while your hopes are danced away, tis you must pay the piper? Here an unexpected factor entered upon the scene. 
a magnificent French fleet under Count de Grasse had sailed for the Chesapeake, and Washington, with a daring worthy of Caesar or Napoleon, decided to transfer his army from the Hudson to Virginia and overwhelm Cornwallis. On August 19th, Washington's army crossed the Hudson at King's Ferry and started on its 400-mile march. On September 18th, it appeared before Yorktown. The French squadron was already on the scene, and Cornwallis was in the trap. There was no escape. On October 17th, he hoisted the white flag, and two days later the British army, over 7,000 in number, laid down its arms. Cornwallis's Surrender, October 19th, 1781 When British troops first landed here, with Howe commander o'er them, they thought they'd make us quake for fear and carry all before them. With thirty thousand men or more, and she without assistance, America must needs give o'er and make no more resistance. But Washington, her glorious son, of British hosts the terror, soon by repeated overthrows convinced them of their error. Let Princeton and let Trinton tell what gallant deeds he's done, sir, and Monmouth's plains where hundreds fell, and thousands more have run, sir. Cornwallis, too, when he approached Virginia's old dominion, thought he would soon her conqueror be, and so was North's opinion. From state to state, with rapid stride, his troops had marched before, sir, till quite elate with martial pride, he thought all dangers o'er, sir. But our allies, to his surprise, the Chesapeake had entered, and now too late he cursed his fate and wished he never had ventured. For Washington no sooner knew the visit he had paid her than to his parent state he flew to crush the bold invader. When he sat down before the town, his lordship soon surrendered. His martial pride he laid aside and cased the British standard. Gods, how this stroke will North provoke, and all his thoughts confuse, sir, and how the peers will hang their ears when first they hear the news, sir. Be peace, the glorious end of war, by this event effected and be the name of Washington to latest times respected. Then let us toast America, and France in union with her, and may Great Britain rue the day her hostile bands came hither. The Surrender of Cornwallis Come, all ye bold Americans, to you the truth I tell. Tis of a sad disaster which late on Britain fell. "'Twas near the height of old Yorktown where cannons loud did roar, "'a summons to Cornwallis to fight or else give o'er. "'A summons to surrender was sent unto the Lord, "'which made him feel like poor Burgoyne and quickly draw his sword, "'saying, Must I give o'er those glittering troops, those ships and armies too, "'and yield to General Washington and his brave noble crew? "'A council to surrender this Lord did then command, what say you, my brave heroes, to yield you must depend? Don't you hear the bombshells flying, boys, and the thundering cannons roar? De Grass is in the harbor, and Washington's on shore. T'was on the 19th of October, in the year of 81, Cornwallis did surrender to General Washington. Six thousand chosen British troops marched out and grounded arms. Huzzah, ye bold Americans, for now sweet music charms. Six thousand chosen British troops to Washington resigned, besides some thousand Hessians that could not stay behind. Both refugees and Tories all, when the devil gets his due. Oh, now we have got thousands, boys, but then we should have few. Unto New York this lord has gone, surrendering, you see, and for to write these doleful lines unto his majesty. For to contradict those lines which he before had sent, that he and his brave British crew were conquerors where they went. Here's a health to General Washington and his brave noble crew, likewise unto de Grasse and all that liberty pursue. May they scourge these bloody tyrants all from our Yankee shore, and with the arms of freedom cause the wars they all are o'er. Early on a dark morning of the fourth week in October, an honest old German slowly pacing the streets of Philadelphia on his night watch began shouting, Bosch drei o'clock und governalisch ist dekend. And light sleepers sprang out of bed and threw up their windows. The whole country burst into jubilation at the news, and every village green was ablaze with bonfires. 
News from Yorktown, October 1781. Past two o'clock and Cornwallis is taken. How the voice rolled down the street, till the silence rang and echoed with the stir of hurrying feet. In the hush of the Quaker city, as the night drew on to morn, how it startled the troubled sleepers like the cry for a man-child born. Past two o'clock and Cornwallis is taken. How they gathered man and maid, here the child with a heart for the flintlock, there the trembling grandsire stayed. From the stateliest homes of the city, from the hovels that love might scorn, how they followed that ringing summons like the cry for a king's heir born. Past two o'clock and Cornwallis is taken, I can see the quick lights flare, see the glad wild face at the window, half dumb in a breathless stare. In the pause of an hour portentous, in the gloom of a hope forlorn, how it throbbed to the star-deep heavens like the cry for a nation born. Past two o'clock and Cornwallis is taken. How the message is sped and gone to the farm and the town and the forest till the world was one vast dawn. To distant and slave-sunk races bowed down in their chains that morn. How it swept on the winds of heaven like a cry for God's justice born. Lewis Worthington Smith An Ancient Prophecy, written soon after the surrender of Cornwallis. When a certain great king, whose initial is G, forces stamps upon paper and folks to drink tea, when these folks burn his tea and stamped paper like stubble, you may guess that this king is then coming to trouble. But when a petition he treads under feet and sends over the ocean an army and fleet, when that army, half famished and frantic with rage, is cooped up with a leader whose name rhymes to cage, when that leader goes home dejected and sad, you may then be assured the king's prospects are bad. But when B and C with their armies are taken, this king will do well if he saves his own bacon. In the year 1782, a stroke he shall get that will make him look blue, and soon, very soon, shall the season arrive, when Nebuchadnezzar to pasture shall drive. In the year 83 the affair will be over, and he shall eat turnips that grow in Hanover. The face of the lion will then become pale. He shall yield fifteen teeth and be sheared of his tail. O king, my dear king, you shall be very sore. From the stars and the stripes you will mercy implore, and your lion shall growl, but hardly bite more. Philip Freneau End of section 19section 20 of poems of american history volume 2 the revolution this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by larry wilson chapter 11 peace the news of cornwallis's surrender was received with consternation in Great Britain. The king declared that he would abdicate rather than acknowledge the independence of the United States. Lord North resigned. Lord Germain was dismissed, and Sir Henry Clinton was superseded in command of the army by Sir Guy Carleton. On Sir Henry Clinton's recall, May 1782 the dog that is beat has a right to complain sir harry returns a disconsolate swain to the face of his master the devil's anointed to the country provided for thieves disappointed our freedom he thought to a tyrant must fall he concluded the weakest must go to the wall the more he was flattered the bolder he grew he quitted the old world to conquer the new but in spite of the deeds he has done in his garrison and they have been curious beyond all comparison he now must go home at the call of his king to answer the charges that arnold may bring but what are the acts which this chief has achieved if good it is hard he should now be aggrieved and the more as he fought for his national glory nor valued a farthing the right of the story this famous great man, the two birds of his feather, 
and the Cerberus frigate came over together. But of all the bold chiefs that remeasure the trip, not two have been known to return in one ship. Like children that wrestle and scuffle in sport, they are very well pleased as long as unhurt, but a thump on the nose or a blow in the eye ends the fray, and they go to their daddy and cry. Sir Clinton, thy deeds have been mighty and many. You said all our paper was not worth a penny. Tis nothing but rags, quoth honest Will Tyron. Are rags to discourage the sons of the lion? But Clinton thought thus. It is folly to fight when things may be easier by methods come right. There is such an art as counterfeitation, and I'll do my utmost to honor our nation. I'll show this damned country that I can enslave her, and that by the help of a skillful engraver, and then let the rebels take care of their bacon, we'll play em a trick, or I'm vastly mistaken. But the project succeeded not quite to your liking, so you paid off your artist and gave up bill striking. But tis an affair I am glad you are quit on. You had surely been hanged had you tried it in Britain. At the taking of Charlestown, you cut a great figure. The terms you propounded were terms full of rigor. You could not foresee poor Charlie's disgrace, nor how soon your own colors would go to the case. When the town had surrendered, the more to disgrace ye, like another to Britain that did at Stacy. You broke all the terms yourself had extended, because you supposed the rebellion was ended. Whoever the Tories marked out as a Whig, if gentle or simple or little or big, no matter to you, to kill em and spite em, you soon had em where the dogs could bite em. Then, thinking these rebels were snug and secure, you left them to Rawdon and Nesbit Balfour, the face of the latter no mask need be drawed on, and to fish for the devil my bait should be Rawdon. Returning to York with your ships and your plunder, and boasting that rebels must shortly knock under, the first thing that struck you as soon as you landed was the fortress at West Point where Arnold commanded. You thought, if friend Arnold this fort will deliver, we shall then be masters of all Hudson's River. The east and the south losing communication, the Yankees will die by the act of starvation. So off you sent Andre, not guided by Palos. You soon purchased Arnold with him in the gallows. Your loss, I conceive, than your gain was far greater. You lost a good fellow and got a damned traitor. Now Carlton comes over to give you relief, a knight like yourself and commander-in-chief. But the chief he will get, you may tell the dear honey, will be a black eye, hard knocks, and no money. Now with Britain strike home, your sorrows dispel. Away to your master and honestly tell that his arms and his artists can nothing avail. His men are too few and his tricks are too stale. Advise him at length to be just and sincere, of which not a symptom as yet doth appear. As we plainly perceive from his sending Sir Guy, commissioned to steal and commissioned to lie. Freeman's Journal, May twenty second, seventeen eighty two. George the Third also declared that he would retain the cities of New York and Charleston at all hazards, but it was soon out of his power to retain Charleston at least. General Leslie, in command there, found himself in dire straits for supplies, and on December fourteenth, seventeen eighty two, evacuated the city and sailed away for Halifax. On the departure of the British from Charleston, December fourteenth, seventeen eighty two. His triumphs of a moment done, his race of desolation run, the Briton, yielding to his fears, to other shores with sorrow steers. To other shores and coarser climes he goes, reflecting on his crimes, his broken oaths, a murdered hain, and blood of thousands split in vain. To Cooper's stream, advancing slow, Ashley no longer tells his woe, no longer mourns his limpid flood, discolored deep with human blood. Lo, where those social streams combine, again the friends of freedom join, 
and while they stray where they once bled rejoice to find their tyrants fled since memory paints that dismal day when british squadrons held the sway and circling close on every side by sea and land retreat denied shall she recall that mournful scene and not the virtues of a green who great in war in danger tried has won the day and crushed their pride through barren wastes and ravaged lands he led his bold undaunted bands through sickly climes his standard bore where never army marched before by fortitude with patience joined the virtues of a noble mind he spread where'er our wars are known his country's honour and his own like hercules his generous plan was to redress the wrongs of men like him accustomed to subdue he freed a world from monsters too through every want and every ill we saw him persevering still through autumn's damps and summer's heat till his great purpose was complete like the bold eagle from the skies that stoops to seize his trembling prize he darted on the slaves of kings at camden heights and utah springs ah had our friends that day led the fray survived the ruins of that day we should not damp our joy with pain nor sympathizing now complain strange that those who nobly dare death always claim so large a share that those of virtue most refined are soonest to the grave consigned but fame is theirs and future days on pillared brass shall tell their praise shall tell when cold neglect is dead these for their country fought and bled philip Frenot. however the king might froth and bluster it was evident that he was beaten he was forced to bow to the inevitable and on december fifth seventeen eighty two in his speech at the opening of parliament he recommended that peace be made with the colonies in america and that they be declared free and independent on the british king's speech recommending peace with the american states december fifth seventeen eighty two grown sick of war and war's alarms good george has changed his note at last conquest and death have lost their charms he and his nation stand aghast to think what fearful lengths they've gone and what a brink they stand upon old butte and north twin sons of hell if you advised him to retreat before our vanquished thousands fell prostrate submissive at his feet awake once more his latent flame and bid us yield you all you claim the macedonian wept and sighed because no other world was found where he might glut his rage and pride and by its ruin be renowned the world that sawney wished to view george fairly had and lost it too let jarring powers make war or peace monster no peace can greet your breast our murdered friends can never cease to hover round and break your rest the furies will your bosom tear remorse distraction and despair and hell with all its fiends be there cursed be the ship that e'er set sail hence freighted for your odious shore may tempests o'er her strength prevail destruction round her roar may nature all her aids deny the sun refuse his light the needle from its object fly no star appear by night till the base pilot conscious of his crime directs the prow to some more christian clime genius that first our race designed to other kings impart the finer feelings of the mind the virtues of the heart whene'er the honours of a throne fall to the bloody and the base like britain's tyrant pull them down like his be their disgrace hibernia seize each native right neptune exclude him from the main like her that sank with all her freight the royal george take all his fleet and never let them rise again confine him to his gloomy isle let scotland rule her half 
spare him to curse his fate awhile, and Whitehead, thou to write his epitaph. Philip Freneau England and America in 1782 O thou that sendest out the man to rule by land and sea, strong mother of a lion line, be proud of those strong sons of thine who wrenched their rights from thee. What wonder if, in noble heat, those men thine arms withstood, retaught the lesson that thou hadst taught, and in thy spirit with thee fought, who sprang from English blood. But thou rejoice with liberal joy, lift up thy rocky face, and shatter, when the storms are black, in many a streaming torrent back, the seas that shock thy base. Whatever harmonies of law the growing world assume, thy work is thine, the single note from the deep chord which Hampton smote will vibrate to the doom. Alfred Tennyson A preliminary treaty of peace was finally agreed upon. Carleton received orders to evacuate New York, and on October 18, 1783, Congress issued a general order disbanding the American Army. On Disbanding the Army, October 18, 1783 Ye brave Columbian bands, a long farewell. Well have ye fought for freedom, nobly done, your martial task, the meed immortal won, and time's last record shall your triumphs tell. Once friendship made their cup of suffering sweet, the dregs how bitter, now those bands must part. Ah, never, never more on earth to meet, distilled from gall that inundates the heart, what tears from heroes' eyes are seen to start. Ye too farewell who fell in fields of gore, And changed tempestuous toil for rest serene. Soon shall we join you on the peaceful shore, Though gulfs irremeable roll between, Thither by death tides borne, As ye full soon have been. David Humphreys November 25th was fixed upon as the date for the evacuation of New York. Early on that day, Carleton got his troops on shipboard, and by the middle of the afternoon the city was in the hands of the Americans. The song, which is given below, was composed for and sung upon this occasion. Evacuation of New York by the British, November 25th, 1783 They come, they come, the heroes come, with sounding fife, with thundering drum, their ranks advance in bright array, the heroes of America. He comes, tis mighty Washington, words fail to tell all he has done, our hero, guardian, father, friend, his fame can never, never end. He comes, he comes, our Clinton comes, justice her ancient seat resumes, from shore to shore, let shouts resound, for justice comes with freedom crowned. She comes, the angelic virgin, peace, and bid stern war his horrors cease, O blooming virgin with us stay, and bless, O bless America. Since freedom has our efforts crowned, let flowing bumpers pass around. The toast is, freedom's favorite son, health, peace, and joy to Washington. On Thursday, December 4th, the principal officers of the army assembled at Francis Tavern to take a final leave of their beloved chief. A few days later, at Annapolis, Washington resigned his commission and betook himself to the quiet of his estate at Mount Vernon. Occasioned by General Washington's arrival in Philadelphia on his way to his residence in Virginia. December 1783 the great unequal conflict past, the Briton banished from our shore, peace, heaven descended, comes at last, and hostile nations rage no more. From fields of death the weary swain, returning, seeks his native plain. In every vale he smiles serene, freedom's bright stars more radiant rise, new charms she adds to every scene, her brilliant sun illumines our skies. Remotest realms, admiring stand, and hail 
the hero of our land he comes the genius of these lands fame's thousand tongues his worth confess who conquered with his suffering bands and grew immortal by distress thus calm succeed the stormy blast and valor is repaid at last o washington thrice glorious name what due rewards can man decree empires are far below thy aim and sceptres have no charms for thee virtue alone has your regard and she must be your great reward encircled by extorted power monarchs must envy your retreat who cast in some ill-fated hour their country's freedom at their feet twas yours to act a nobler part for injured freedom had your heart for ravaged realms and conquered seas rome gave the great imperial prize and swelled with pride for feats like these transferred her heroes to the skies a brighter scene your deeds display you gain those heights a different way when faction reared her bristly head and joined with tyrants to destroy where'er you marched the monster fled timorous her arrows to employ hosts catched from you a bolder flame and despots trembled at your name ere war's dread horrors ceased to reign what leader could your place supply chiefs crowded to the embattled plain prepared to conquer or to die heroes arose but none like you could save our lives and freedom too in swelling verse let kings be read and princes shine in polished prose without such aid your triumph spread where the convex ocean flows to indian worlds by seas embraced and tartar tyrant of the waste throughout the east you gain applause and soon the old world taught by you shall blush to own her barbarous laws shall learn instruction from the new monarch shall hear the humble plea nor urge too far the proud decree despising pomp and vain parade at home you stay while france and spain the secret ardent wish conveyed and hailed you to their shores in vain in vernon's grove you shun the throne admired by kings but seen by none your fame thus spread to distant lands may envy's fiercest blasts endure like egypt's pyramids it stands built on a basis more secure time's latest age shall own in you the patriot and the statesman too now hurrying from the busy sea where thy potomac's waters flow mayst thou enjoy thy rural reign and every earthly blessing know thus he who rome's proud legion swayed returned and sought his sylvan shade not less in wisdom than in war freedom shall still employ your mind slavery must vanish wide and far till not a trace is left behind your counsels not bestowed in vain shall still protect this infant reign so when the bright all-cheering sun from our contracted view retires though folly deems his race is run on other worlds he lights his fires cold climes beneath his influence glow and frozen rivers learn to flow o oh, say thou great exalted name what muse can boast of equal lays thy worth disdains all vulgar fame transcends the noblest poet's praise art soars unequal to the flight and genius sickens at the height for states redeemed our western reign restored by thee to milder sway thy conscious glory shall remain when this great globe is swept away and all is lost that pride admires and all the pageant scene expires philip freneau early in january word reached america that the definite treaty of peace had been signed in paris on november thirtieth seventeen eighty three the independence of the united states was acknowledged the mississippi was set as the western boundary of the country the st croix and the great lakes as the northern and the gulf of mexico as the southern on january fourteenth seventeen eighty four this treaty was ratified by congress 
The American Soldier's Hymn Tis God that girds our armor on, and all our just designs fulfills. Through him our feet can swiftly run, and nimbly climb the steepest hills. Lessons of war from him we take, and manly weapons learn to wield. Strong bows of steel with ease we break, forced by our stronger arms to yield. Tis God that supports our right, his just revenge our foes pursue. Tis he that with resistless might fierce nations to his power subdues. Our universal safeguard he, from whom our lasting honors flow, he made us great and set us free from our remorseless bloody foe. Therefore, to celebrate his fame, our grateful voice to heaven will raise, and nations, strangers to his name, shall thus be taught to sing his praise. A day of solemn thanksgiving was set apart and universally observed throughout the country, which set its face toward the future with a heart full of hope and high resolve. Thanksgiving Hymn the Lord above, in tender love, hath saved us from our foes. Through Washington the thing is done, the war is at a close. America has won the day, through Washington our chief. Come, let's rejoice with heart and voice, and bid adieu to grief. Now we have peace, and may increase in number, wealth, and arts, if every one, like Washington, will strive to do their parts. Then let's agree, since we are free, all needless things to shun, and lay aside all pomp and pride like our great Washington. Use industry, and frugal be, like Washington the brave, so shall we see, twill easy be, our country for to save. From present wars and future foes, and all that we may fear, while Washington the great brave one shall as our chief appear. Industry and frugality will all our taxes pay. In virtuous ways we'll spend our days, and for our rulers pray. The thirteen states united sets in Congress simply grand. The Lord himself preserve their health, that they may rule the land. Whilst every state without its mate doth rule itself by laws, will sovereign be, and always free, to grieve there is no cause. But all should try, both low and high, our freedom to maintain. Pray God to bless our grand Congress and cease from every sin. Then sure am I, true liberty of every sort will thrive. With one accord will praise the Lord, all glory to him give. To whom all praise is due always, for he is all in all. George Washington, that noble one, on his great name doth call. Our Congress, too, before they do acknowledge him supreme, come, let us all before him fall, and glorify his name. Land of the Willful Gospel From Psalm of the West Land of the Willful Gospel, Thou worst and thou best, Tall Adam of lands, new maid of the dust of the West, Thou wroughtest alone in the garden of God, unblessed, till he fashioned life freedom to lie for thine eve on thy breast. Till out of thy heart's dear neighborhood, out of thy side he fashioned an intimate sweet one, and brought thee a bride. Cry hail, nor be well that the wound of her coming was wide. Lo, freedom reached forth where the world as an apple hung red. Let us taste the whole radiant round of it, gaily, she said. If we die, at the worst we shall lie as the first of the dead. Knowledge of the good and ill, O land, she hath given thee. Perilous goodhoods of choosing have rent thee and riven thee. Will's high adoring to ill's low exploring hath driven thee. Freedom, thy wife, hath uplifted thy life and clean shriven thee. Her shalt thou clasp for a balm to the scars of thy breast. Her shalt thou kiss for a calm to thy wars of unrest. Her shalt extol in the psalm of the soul of the West. 
for weakness in freedom grows stronger than strength with a chain and error in freedom will come to lamenting his stain till freely repenting he whiten his spirit again and friendship in freedom will blot out the bounding of race and straight law in freedom will curve to the rounding of grace and fashion in freedom will die of the lie in her face sydney lanier end of section twenty end of poems of american history volume two the revolution by various